I think this is a pretty good topic because I think we may have finally gotten where we need to be in thoracolumbar trauma classification. My cervical partners are going to follow. I think they still have a little bit of a road to hoe. It's more challenging, I think, for them because uh, there's more diversity in the spine. But I think thoracolumbar classifications, I think we're where we need to be. And, and uh, we're going to go over, go over that. Let's see here. So why bother? So there's three reasons I look at the classify. One is so we can communicate with each other, communicate with non-medical people, to do scientific studies. So when we're comparing something, we're actually comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges, and then to guide treatment. So our communication, for a communication to be effective, it's got to be simple and reliable. We've got to be able to reproduce it. You know, everyone's got to know what they're talking about, and it should be simple. For scientific study, it has to be reproducible. Uh, otherwise, we're comparing apples to oranges, and 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 it's not not valid. And then, and lastly, it should help us guide treatment, whether we do operations or non-operative. Ideally, it would be nice if we could guide our specific type of treatment. I think that's a little more stretch for what we had now. But guiding operative and non-operative may be may be a, a worthy goal. So why classify? All right, let's look at this thoracic lumbar fracture. This is one type. Okay. Here's another fracture of thoracic lumbar. It doesn't look too much different, but it's a different fracture. It behaves differently. It's a different beast. Here's another fracture. This one behaves differently. Our treatment's going to be different. We're going to go through these as we go through the talk and say why they're different and where they fit. And then lastly, another thoracic lumbar fracture. Four different fractures. <clears throat> so our objectives here, we're going to try to gain insight into the historical evolution of thoracic lumbar classifications. And I'm not going to dwell on that too much because I think it's more important to discuss where we are now. We want to understand the most current accepted classification, which I think is the new AO classification. And then we're going to classify some of these case examples. So as something that we could think about as we go through, this is a 57-year-old male who was a small airplane crash. He was actually his brother, who's an orthopedic surgeon from Alabama, flew up to pick him up in West Virginia, fly him back down for the West Virginia-Alabama game, and they wrecked going up, off, taken off from Morgantown. Him and his brother had both the same injury. One had some deficit, one didn't. This brother had a perineal paresthesia, poor rectal tone, bilateral anterior tibia HL gastroc weakness. And you can see his fracture pattern. <clears throat> this is what the CT looked like. You can see his retropulsion. Uh, you can see some fracture in the posterior facets. So the premise of all our classification in large part is something stable or unstable. This is what's going to guide our treatment. And this, this statement's been, is really the crux of instability. Unfortunately, even though it, it gives us an idea, it's hard to really get your hands around. And it's the loss of the spine's ability to maintain patterns of displacement under physiological loads so that there is no major deformity or progression of deformity, no initial or additional neurological deficit, no incapacitating pain. So really what we want to do when we treat thoracic lumbar fractures, we want to address the deformity. We want to prevent it from getting worse, correct it if it needs to be. We want to address neurological issues. We want to try to help them recover, uh, and we want to prevent them from getting worse. And then lastly, we want to deal with weight pain. And th this is one of the challenges in not well study is how are they doing really at five years? So classifications evolved over many years. Uh, some of which are, are the more modern ones, the Dennis, McCormick, the AO, uh, thoracolumbar, uh, T-Lix classification. And early on, people talked about two columns. They talked about the anterior column, which was the vertebral body, which was resisted axial load. And they talked about the posterior column, which re resisted flexion or a tension band. And it's interesting. We, we eventually went to the Dennis classification. And, and, and you got to understand how these evolved. We were using CT at the time. So we had gone from plain films and tomograms to CT, and people started realizing, well, there's this, there's this burst fracture one, and how do we fit this into these two column things? And he said, all right, there's a middle column, and if it involves the middle column that's displaced, then it's a burst fracture. And so he introduced the concept of middle column. Interestingly, we've gone all the way back to really just talking about two columns. Is it an anterior or posterior? The, and so these were sort of morphological classifications. If you look at Ferguson and Allen classification, he tried to make it a little more mechanistic by saying it's compression, it's flexion distraction, uh, 
And then the gains classification came about, and I think Andrew or somebody mentioned this yesterday, and this is an assessment or grading of vertebral body comminution. And so why'd they do that? This came about because we were starting to use posterior pedicle screw constructs. The AO had come out with the Chance uh, pin and the AO fix it or intern. And people were doing short segment posterior screw fixation. It was the first time we could really use screws to fix fractures and not hooks or the old Harrington systems. And what we were seeing is lots of screws were breaking. And so people were saying, well, maybe we need to add anterior support to this. And there was a camp that thought most of them should be done anteriorly as opposed to posteriorly. And so this classification came out as a way to say, okay, the ones that are more common that have a higher grade, they probably are, posterior fixation probably is not adequate. Now, again, we've changed and evolved and our posterior fixation is so strong and powerful that it plays less of a role, but conceptually it's still important because there are times that anterior support's an issue. The AO classification expanded upon this. And the AO classification in typical AO fashion made an ABC. A is not as bad as B, as bad as C, and they try to simplify it into an ABC. And if you looked at this classification where A was just the compression injuries, B were the distraction injuries, and C were the translational rotation injuries or fracture dislocations, it was fairly simple and reliable in terms of inter-observer and intra-observer reliability. However, they, they wanted to make it better for scientific studies. So they broke it down into all these subgroups, 53 injury patterns. And once you got to A3.345, I don't think anyone understood it, and the intra and intra observer reliability completely broke down. It wasn't very good. It also, none of these classifications ever took into account uh, neurological deficits. And so Spine Trauma Study Group and Alex Vaquera came up with a way of trying to incorporate what was really important. And part of it was the morphology, because all these years we learned the morphology but really what made something stable or unstable often was the posterior uh, ligamentous complex. And so it, it started with morphology. Is this a compression, a burst, a flexion, distraction, a fracture, dislocation? But then it said, what's the status of the posterior ligamentous complex? Because if you call somebody with a burst fracture, they have a burst, their next question is, what's the status of the posterior ligamentous complex? Because when we go from stable to unstable burst, that's the key component. And then lastly, they said, why isn't there a neurological component, which is probably the main driver to surgery in any of these classifications? And there were separate neurological classifications, uh, but why isn't that in there? And so a system was to develop, a scoring system. It's almost an injury severity score that incorporated these elements. And these three things, and so you would say, what's the morphology, what's the status of post ligamentous complex, and what's the neurology? And then based on that scoring system, you could pretty reliably decide if something was operative or non-operative. Anything below four was non-operative. And I think if we showed a lot of those, we would, for the most part, agree on that. Anything above four was operative. And I think, again, for the most part, we could agree on that. Unfortunately, if it was a four, which generally meant it was a burst fracture with indeterminate status of the posterior ligamentous complex, we still don't know what to do with that. And I'm not sure we still do. We're at, there's actually an ongoing large prospective study to look just at that injury internationally and see if we can figure out what we should be doing. So our patient that I showed you was a Dennis Burst. He was a burst fracture. Middle column was involved. In the original, he was an AO type B probably because the T12 spinous process was out. You could argue it was an a, what would be called an A3. Uh, In the Telix classification, we got two for burst. The posterior ligamentous complex, there's some fracture, but it's not clear. It got a two as indeterminate, but there was a cotequine injury, which meant it got a three. So it was a seven total. So that's an operative fracture based on that. So it's still confusing because if you called me and said, hey, I got a seven, I, I don't know what you mean. And if I studied sevens, I, I can't compare sevens because there's lots of ways to get the seven in the T-Lix. And so... What, what happened was, is they said, well, why don't we just simplify the AO classification the way we like to think about things, and let's add the components to the TLIX, the neurological status, and come up with a better classification. And I really think that we may, may have gotten with this. So what they did is they said, okay, in the AOs, let's simplify the A's. There doesn't have to be a million A's, because there's only a few things that really matter. 
So they made a category of A0. That, those were the spinous process and transverse process fractures. And all those, those components can indicate a greater fracture. In isolation, they're pretty benign fractures, and they need a place to put those. Those are A0s. And A1 is a compression fracture. It can be inferior end plate, superior end plate. It doesn't really matter which, which end plate it is because the treatment's the same. There's nobody that distinguishes that as a form of treatment. So they said A1s are just compression fractures. Burst fracture, or A2, is a, a very peculiar fracture called a pincer fracture. And what happens, there's a coronal split in the vertebral body, and it's a severe axial load flexion injury where that anterior half of the body splits off and can spit out the front. And I'm going to show you why that's important. People said that fracture really isn't a burst. It's really not a compression, and it behaves badly. It can be treated non-operatively, but not always. And, and so they separate it. And then for burst, they said, you know, it may matter whether the burst just involves the inferior, superior portion of the body or superior and inferior. Because, you know, if we remember the gains classification, the more comminution, it was more important. And it seemed to matter. So they said if it just involves the superior end plate, it'll be an A3. If it involves superior and inferior end plate, we're going to call that an A4 because it may... It may distinguish. Maybe we need to go anterior on A4s. Maybe we don't have to on A3s. So next they said, okay, the Bs. These are our flexion distraction. This is when the posterior ligamentous complex is disrupted. Okay? Those are B injuries. And we don't need a lot of B injuries. The B1 is the true bony chance. This is what chance describes. So when you say a chance fracture, this is really the injury you're looking at. It's pure bony. It's through the pedicles, through the bony poster elements. It's a pediatric fracture. We almost never see this fracture pattern in an adult. It's a seatbelt injury. And the reason it's important is because maybe it can be treated non-operatively. It may be the only B that can be. B2 or all the other flexion distraction injuries. It really doesn't matter whether it's partly bone, partly ligament, through the facets, pure ligamentous. Doesn't matter. It's a flexion distraction. The posterior ligamentous complex is disrupted. This is a large group of injuries, B2. And then B3 injuries are extension injuries. They're really not posterior ligamentous, but they're extension injuries where there's no disruption posteriorly, no translation. This is actually a pretty uncommon injury, and you see it in ankylosed spines, either dish spines or ankylosing spondylitis. If you have a B injury and there's an A component, you also classify the A component. So you, you go by the works. You'd say, okay, I got a B2 injury here. That means I've disrupted the posterior ligaments complex, and there's an A3 injury anteriorly. Because that may be different than if there's no compression. It's just fractured in the back, but no compression in the front. So you could say I have a B2, A3. I know exactly what you mean. Posterior ligament is disruption. I don't know whether it's all bone, all ligament, but it's disrupted. And I have a burst fracture involving superior end plate up front. No, exactly. Then C, as they said, they're only just C injuries. We don't need to break down. Once it's a fracture dislocation, once there's translation, rotation, and stability, it makes no difference. They're all operative, and the concepts of treating them are very similar. When you have a C injury, you can also grade the A injury. So you might have a CA3 because the body comminution, again, may play a role. Maybe you're going to do it posterior, but they need secondary anterior support. So it's pretty simple. Then they said, okay, like a cancer classification, let's add another letter component and for the neurology. And they said, if they're intact, it's an N0. So I might have a B2, A3, N0, posterior ligamentous complex out, anterior burst that has, is intact. And I know exactly what you mean when you put that. N1 means they had a transient deficit at the scene. Said my legs were tingling or weak, but it's gone away already when they get to the hospital. That's important because you know they dinged the cord. That, that, that will drive us to surgery, that in itself sometimes. That means they're at risk to develop deficit afterwards. Is it a pure radicular? Because an L5 burst with an L5 root injury, we don't necessarily have to operate on that. So pure root symptoms. Incomplete spinal cord, complete, and then we don't know the status. They're obtunded, they're head injured, they're intubated, we don't know the status. Then they only put two modifiers in. They recognize that sometimes it's hard to tell if the posterior ligamentous complex is out. So there is this indeterminate group. 
And that, that's a hard group to treat. And so they said, okay, we'll have an N1 modifier. That means we're not sure the ligamentous complex is out. We're not convinced it's intact or not intact, but we're going to put that modifier. And then they put an M2 in. M2 means there's other factors that are in play that are driving treatment. So I may not be able to do the ideal treatment that I want to do or think is necessary because of other factors. They're a multi-trauma. They have burns over their skin. Uh, they're, they, they have a disease process like osteoporosis or ankylosing spondylitis that changes it. So any factor that is modifying your ability to treat the patient like you would if it was an isolated fracture. Pretty simple. So let's look at these four patterns that I showed in the beginning. This first one is a pincer fracture. You can see the posterior body's intact. It's got a coronal split. And this, this fracture is an A2 pincer fracture. And here's why that's important. Here's why they separated it. So here's that patient with your initial standing films. Looks okay. I'm thinking, I might be able to treat this non-operatively, but you have to be extremely vigilant of this fracture because that superior that inferior anterior corner of full of two is going to want to settle right back down into that coronal split. And you can see that happening when they came back at two week visit and that patient gets changed to a non-operative treatment. So this is a fracture pattern that we'll often operate on, or if we're going to treat it non-operative, it needs to be followed closely. This second fracture is an A4 burst. It's a burst fracture. Posterior ligamentous complex is intact. It involves superior inferior end plate. This fracture is the B1 fracture. Very unique. It's a pediatric fracture only. And why separate it? Why bother? Because this is the only B fracture that can be treated non-operatively. All you have to do is restore extension, get the two bony ends to contact, and you can treat it. This is an example of a young girl, a car accident, seatbelt injury. She had abdominal injuries, and this fracture pattern this is her, and this is that same patient in a cast in extension, and this is her at three months when we took off the cast, looks normal. Now, I will tell you that many times, and we treat this, this is a six-year-old, and what, what we'll do often now is use an internal cast, and we'll talk about this in MIS where we percutaneously do that, and then we take their hardware out down the road, okay? This, our last injury, when we see it, is a C fracture. You can see there's rotation and translation in this fracture. This is in the C group. Anteriorly, we can grade the anterior injury, but it's a C group with probably an A4 injury, burst, superior, and inferior end plate. And this is a girl that we treated all posteriorly, and you can see her riding her mountain bike uh, a year out. So our case that I showed you, our 57-year-old male with a what appears to be a cotequine or conus injury, but incomplete. Uh, and this fracture pattern, it's at L1. So he's got an L1. We think the posterior ligament's out because we saw the fracture in the spinous process and the fracture in the posterior facet. So there's a posterior ligamentous complex injury, B2. So that's the worst grade. So it's an L1, B2. Anteriorly, it's a burst, but just superior and played A3. So I could close my eyes and say, I've got a, I've got a B2, A3, and I, I, I see that fracture. There it is, because I, I saw that with my eyes closed. And then it's an N3. It's an incomplete spinal cord injury. That could be conus, cord, or cauda equina, because it really doesn't matter for our treatment decisions. Okay, And so I know exactly what that guy is. I can describe him. I just don't know if it was from an airplane crash and how old he is. I can also look and say, oh, there's also an L2, A1 injury because there's a compression and that may change things, okay? So I know exactly what this is. So I know I have to achieve stability, probably posteriorly, because I've got a tension band, I want to restore the tension band. Uh, I probably don't need to do anterior support because it's an A3. And I, and I do need to actively do something to decompress the canal because it's an N3. So I took that classification and I translated it into my treatment decision making very clearly and succinctly. And we can compare that. I can say to Rick Sasso, because I know Rick's thinking, I, I could, you, you should do that anteriorly, okay? But I can compare it now. I can say, okay, Rick, let's look at our B2, A3, N3 fractures. Let's look at all of them and let's see if we can do them anteriorly or posterior and I can compare them. So this is this patient at three months, um, and, and uh, canals open, we did it all posteriorly. So 
in summary, you know, we want to classify now based on the fracture morphology, the posterior ligamentous complex, the neurological status. Those are the three important components. We need it needs to be able to communicate. We need to be able to compare similar fractures, and we would like it to help determine our treatment. I really think that this current AO classification, we finally have evolved to the point that we get it. And, I, and I'm not sure, in all honesty, in my opinion, we need to do much more at this point unless our treatment changes and dictate a, a need for change. Thank you.